This is the 1967 original Citron driven by actor Richard Dreyfus in the movie American Graffiti that was filmed in Petaluma, California in 1973. This video was produced to show you how we know this is the original car from the movie, the real deal. This car has passed through six hands and is now owned by number seven, Cruising the Boulevard, Inc., an all-volunteer, tax-exempt, 501c3, nonprofit California Public Benefit Corporation that was founded in 2005 by a group of classic car and American graffiti enthusiasts to pay tribute to the film, rekindle the happy days it portrays, and to benefit Petaluma. We are here now with the sixth owner of this vehicle, who is going to take us on a tour, and to go through this Citron with a fine-tooth comb to tell you why we know it is the original car. Starting here. This mirror was installed by owner number four. The mirror that you see in the movie was actually a Rambler round mirror that bolted right here. If you pull the inside panel off on this Citron, you will see the two Bondo holes where the mirror was. The front removable split bench picnic seats are a dead giveaway because it's only the second 1967 Citron experts we spoke with have ever seen with this configuration. You will see these split seats at the Mel's Diner scene at the end of the movie. Owner number three was not especially kind to the car and didn't care all that much about the movie, so he first replaced the original gray seat covers with blue and white striped material that we dyed back to gray to better match the movie. He also tried to find someone to paint the car, and after discovering nobody would, he painted the car himself. And of course, the new paint did not match the original Glacier Blue, but you can still see that original paint right here on the dashboard instrument panel. Also in the movie, when actor Richard Dreyfus is at the phone booth waiting for Susan Summers to call, you will see a service station sticker on the side of this instrument panel, which has long been removed, but if you line up the lighting just right, you can still see the outline of this sticker. Next to the windshield on the driver's side, we discovered several inches of Bondo where there was damage from a tree or a rock or whatever, and in the movie, you will see a rusted area here in the exact same location, obviously before the repair was done, probably when the car was painted by owner number three. In this area, you will see the kink in the driver's side fender. It was worse in the movie, but that was very helpful, that kink that was popped out. That rascal number three also replaced the original headlights with square headlights, but luckily kept the originals. So here they are back where they belong, and you can see the original Glacier Blue factory paint underneath, along with more of the original Glacier Blue under paint chips in the hood. In the front, low down, you'll see, of course, it's a France car. You'll see an area for a bigger plate. In the movie, they used yellow plates made of paper that were just held in by rubber bands. If you look at the scene with Richard Dreyfus and Ron Howard working on the car, you will see there is a J and seven, at least that's what it looks like. In France, the numbers and letters were not on a plate, but actually painted directly on the metal. As we open the hood, we first see more of the original Glacier Blue factory paint inside the engine compartment and on the inside of the hood. Very rare, according to the experts, and there are also two verification plates that we will zero in for you here just to verify the fact that the identification numbers and such do indeed match the paperwork. And the clincher was this discovery. In the movie, the passenger side fender clearly displayed a deep dent from what looked like a fast-moving hard basketball along with these three crease marks. When feeling under the same fender, the same residual damage was discovered, even after being repaired and not visible from the outside. Okay, back here, this I had my sister order off the internet. It's not quite big enough. The original one to the movie is a little bit bigger. What's interesting about that is when I put it on in Petaluma, 
in 13, I'm going to say, I had put it too low, so I took it off to put it higher. If, on a certain light, and it's a sunny day, if you look at this, the paint job is so poor that you can, when I tore it off to reposition it, you can still see where the original one was. That was another convincing point later on. Again, here's Glacier Blue, okay? All one car, except for that fender and door, all one vehicle all these years. Uh, I won't go in there, but the spare tire uh, I pointed out to the magazine and, and myself earlier that the uh, it's a Michelin tire with France riding. Uh, and I want to note this, that he said he's not sure how she got it here. She bought it in 67 in France, and she was a school teacher, transferred here to San Francisco as teaching. And he doesn't know how he got the vehicle, she got the vehicle over here because you had to be a firefighter or a policeman to be to transfer a vehicle over here back in 1970. The black plate that was with the car was issued, I, I have a plate person, and it was issued in San Francisco in July of 1970, the black plate, which matches up perfectly with the whole story. These, I'm so embarrassed because I've seen the movie at least 700 times, 800 times. I took the magazine to point out, the magazine person, ATN, that these are not correct. This is this bumper's off a later vehicle. Huh. You could take this off and it would be correct. Tail lights, everything else is correct. Okay, as we come over here, this window does not belong here in 1962. So, in 1962, the C two CV would not have this window. So people on the internet pick it apart and say the vehicle's too new. It is too new, but that's this is the only one George Lucas can find. By the way, he found it at uh, Shamrock Motors in Mill Valley because it was being serviced, and the manager knew that Lucas had to have a two CV. So he confronted the school teacher and said, would you be willing to rent this? She said, of course. So that's how the connection made was made, okay? Uh, the other thing I want to point out is in 1962, 2 CV, it was suicide door, okay? This handle huh? would be here. It would open the other way. So the movie critics picked this car apart because they know it's, it's too new for the movie. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is in the movie, uh, this had mud flaps, which hang down quite quite far. Those need to be ordered and put back on the car. Also, the glass code, you might focus in on this or whatever, well, the glass code really gave him an indication when the car was built, uh, and again, he couldn't believe that somehow it got shipped out here, but it did. So, the glass code was a big deal to him. Okay, last but not least, I owned the graffiti uh, at one time, I owned the white Thunderbird Suzanne Summers drove along with this. This car gets far more attention than the T-Bird ever did. It's in the movie seven times. The T-Bird's only in the movie five times. Yet people like myself aren't that focused on this car because it was this and the Toad's motorcycle were the only foreign main vehicles in the movie. Okay, so I'm owner number six. When I went out and looked at the car, and once again out of floor jock, I jacked it up. I uh, looked at all the body to make sure I wasn't buying a bunch of paperwork. By the time I got back to her house, she was furious because uh, she was worried about the paperwork, not the car. So at that point, it was not a smooth transaction until the end. Um, because I, I, I was worried about the body, which again, I confirmed was the car, not just the paperwork. That's all. So there you have it. We know it's the real deal. And now, so do you.